My name is Stan Wojcicki, and I have distinct pleasure and honor to introduce today's panelists, and first to say a few introductory remarks about the topic of forthcoming discussion, namely the neutrino physics. Uh, as I introduce the panelists, I would ask you to stand up and take a seat over here so you're very much visible and prominent. So I want to start by introducing the panel's moderator, Yuri Milner, someone who really needs no introduction. Yuri is the founder of the Breakthrough Prizes, viewed today as the most prestigious recognition of accomplishments in science, a truly Nobel Prize of the 21st century. So why don't we give him a hand for his... <laughs> Please sit down, Yuri. Okay, I will turn now to neutrinos. Since their postulation by Pauli 85 years ago and their first observation by Cowan and Rhines 25 years later, they probably, more que they probably posed more questions that provided answers. They were known to have very tiny mass or no mass at all. But if massless, what symmetry principle dictated that? Did they have any new interactions with matter besides the known extremely weak interaction? Were they their own antiparticle? What role do they play in cosmology or composition of our universe? Are they responsible for matter-antimatter asymmetry and hence for our existence? The list goes on. In 1960s, it was already known that there were two species or flavors of neutrinos, muon and electron. Subsequently, a third lepton flavor, flavor was discovered, the tau. Bruno Pontecorvo pointed out already in 1967 that if neutrinos do have small but non-zero mass, then they can mix and oscillate, i.e. neutrinos of one flavor can change into another one as they propagate through space or matter, and then they can change back again. Whether they have mass was unknown, but it was known that it is at most a million times smaller than that of the lightest known particle, the electron. Thus, if neutrinos mix, the description of a general neutrino state could be expressed either as a linear superposition of the three flavor states, electron, muon, or tau, or of their three mass states. These two descriptions would be related by a unitary three by three matrix. The overarching questions in 1980s, when the story we shall hear today begins, were, do neutrinos have mass? And if so, what are these masses? Neutrino masses imply a mixing ma matrix with four independent parameters. What are these parameters, and how can they be measured? What dictates the values of these masses, of these neutrino masses, and of these matrix elements? What causes these masses to be so incredibly small? Several anomalies in neutrino experiments were observed already in 1980s, which could potentially suggest oscillations, but there appeared to be contradictions and the idea of oscillations was viewed by many as unlikely and outlandish. A new generation of experiments was needed to address these questions. As you will hear, a tremendous progress has been made since that time, and our panelists were the key players in this evolution. But some important issues remain unresolved, as undoubtedly you shall also hear today. Let me now introduce the panelists and try to connect their work to the issues I just mentioned. First, Takaki Kajita and Yurichiro Suzuki, leaders of the Super Kamiokande experiment. Please come and, please come and sit down. Taka is currently director of Institute for Cosmic Ray Research, ICRR, in Tokyo. Yochi is the director of the Kamioka Observatory 
at that institute, and also deputy director of the Kavli Institute for Physics and Mathematics of the Universe. They addressed, respectively, the apparent disappearance of muon neutrinos in cosmic rays and of electron neutrinos from the sun using a very impressive 50 kiloton water Cherenkov detector deep underground. I might just say that it could be that this detector will prove itself to be the most you know, efficient and productive detector ever in high energy physics. Art McDonald is Professor Emeritus of the Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. Art? He was the leader of SNOW, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory collaboration, that addressed the so-called solar neutrino puzzle problem, an apparent deficit of, so -called, of solar neutrinos reaching the Earth. To accomplish that, he and his collaborators spent well over a decade designing and building a thousand ton heavy water detector deep underground in Sudbury, Canada. That commitment took a lot of courage and conviction, since initially there was some skepticism whether there really is a solar anomaly. To give you a flavor of that, let me quote one Nobel Prize winning theorist. Most likely, the solar neutrino problem has nothing whatsoever to do with particle physics. It is a great triumph that astrophysicists are able to predict the number of boron-8 neutrinos coming from the sun as well as they do with an effector of two or three. <laughs> okay. Atsuto Suzuki is the director of Japan's High Energy Research Organization, or KEK, in Tsukuba, Japan. <laughs> he was the founder and leader of the Kamland Collaboration, looking at anti-neutrino interactions coming from all Japanese reactors with a detector of 1,000 tons filled with liquid scintillator and located deep underground in the Kamioka mine in Japan. Kamland complemented snow detector and snow experiment in determining with high precision the parameters relevant to electron neutrino oscillations. Next, let me introduce Yifang Wang and Kambyu Luk, leaders of the Daya Bay experiment located in China. <laughs> Yifeng is the director of the Institute of High Energy Physics in Beijing, China. Kambyu, a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and a senior faculty member at the Lawrence National Berkeley Laboratory. They conceived, designed, and built, and subsequently led the analysis effort for an experiment at Daya Bay in China that consisted of 80 detectors in three locations containing 160 tons of liquid scintillator and looking at anti-neutrinos from six nearby reactors. The goal was to measure precisely one of the mixing parameters that was relevant for the electron neutrino oscillations, and at that time was, uh, was, uh, was not measured and was thought that maybe it's even zero. Let me just. OK, sorry. Oh. I thought for a moment that I lost one page. That would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> OK, finally, Koichiro Nishikawa. He would never forgive me if I had done that, <laughs> because he's an old friend of mine. <laughs> he's the director of the Institute for Particle and Nuclear Studies at KEK and KEK deputy director. He was the founder and leader of the two neutrino accelerator experiments in Japan, K2K and T2K, the second one still in progress. 
The experiments looked for oscillations of NUMU neutrinos, and the results cemented our knowledge of neutrino oscillations. Might add that these experiments were the only ones discussed today that had to generate the neutrinos for the studies. In all the others, the neutrinos came for free, courtesy of cosmic rays, the sun, or power companies. <laughs> Finally, a few concluding remarks before I hand the mic over to Yuri. As you can see, the prizes of this year reorganized contributions of large experimental teams. As an experimentalist, I am delighted to see that. Invariably, the success of these experiments is due not only to the creativity, originality, and leadership of the people at the top, but also to frequently insufficiently recognized efforts of countless students, postdocs, engineers, and junior faculty members. They should feel proud of these accomplishments and this recognition, and we should also give them a hand. Okay, Yuri, your, Thank your you. game. Thank you, uh, Stanley Vajiki, for introduction. Um, I want to add one more thing to this introduction, which is to say that uh, when um, uh, the uh, selection committee of Breakthrough Prize made a decision to uh, award Breakthrough Prize to the uh, five experiments this year. Uh, we did not know that the similar thought process was taking place in Sweden, so we have two, we have two uh, um, panelists uh, today, uh, which is Takaki Kajita and Art McDonald, who were also awarded Nobel Prize. So let's. So um, obviously they, are, uh, um, they have a much, much easier logistical problem than we do because we have to track 1,377 people and, uh, <laughs> and send them the checks. So I think it will take about six months to do that. So, um, so the first question I want to uh, open the panel with is to say, uh, is to ask everyone, uh, what are the big open topics in uh, neutrino physics and maybe even in the particle physics in general? So maybe we'll start from that side. Okay, well, in my opinion, well, I, maybe I cannot say particle physics in general. I want to say about the neutrino physics only. Well, in my opinion, well, I, I think there are two big questions to be or solved or understood. That is, one is the uh, CP vibration in the neutrino sector, and also we'd like to know if neutrinos are Majorana particle or uh, Dirac particle. That, th these two are, I think, the most important questions to be understood in neutrino physics. I, I say slightly different things. <laughs> <laughs> because then that, you know, Everybody is here is physicist, right? So I say rather in the different view. So the part physics, and of course, including neutrinos, is a kind of the, the our, you know, the aim, goal from our curiosity. That is a beginning. So general public, forget about these things. The, what is a basic science? physics science is, is really starting from curiosity. We should come back to that point and again. Arthur? Well, I certainly agree with uh, uh, Professor uh, Kajita about uh, the two topics that are mentioned. And uh, I think uh, uh, one of the nice things about the developments that these experiments have uh, made so far is that they've created low radioactivity underground environments where you can do a number of things. Uh, certainly neutrinoless double beta decay in terms of both the Majorana nature of the neutrino and also the uh, uh, perhaps absolute mass of the neutrino is a very important topic to be pursuing. Uh, but we also have a very big puzzle uh, in terms of uh, dark matter 
uh, which is both a particle physics and a, and a cosmology and astrophysics uh, question as well. And these underground environments uh, give us uh, great opportunities to do direct detection of such uh, particles. So uh, I would add those. I would add that. Yes. Okay, I have a, uh, <coughs> a similar opinions. One is uh, we don't, uh, we still don't know the absolute our, our scale of masses, neutron masses. Neutron oscillation produces the mass difference, not absolute, uh, absolute masses. So our next step is to determine the absolute scale of the neutrino mass. This is one, uh, one future uh, 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 the target. The other one is, uh, as Kajasan said, uh, Majorana or Dirac particle. This is also an open question. Another one, uh, we don't know why the neutrinos, uh, neutron masses are so small, very small, comparing the uh, another particles. Then we need, uh, we need to, to, to understand such mechanism. You know what in, uh, for us to do, we need, we need to uh, 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 we need to uh, produce the, uh, the direct production of uh, heavy, heavy neutrinos. So in future colliders, atom position collider, uh, uh, future colliders have a chance to, the chance to produce the, that heavy uh, uh, neutrinos. This is our very key, uh, key uh, 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 subject for, for future new, neutrino uh, uh, experiments. I take a question to be a long term physics uh, goal. And uh, in general, I, for the long term question, the basic question is simple, I think. Uh, the, what is the flavor and uh, those uh, three generation? Is it closed by the three generation or not? Uh, I think it's a basic question we have to address in the long term uh, uh, program. And, uh, I think uh, the high energy physics should uh, question our basic stance, basic scheme, like a three generation, uh, three by three matrix. Is that close or not that uh, uh, eventually it must be checked uh, with uh, experimental uh, observation? Well, in the neutrino sector, I do agree that knowing the, the nature of neutrino, that is, okay, whether it's a Dirac type or a Majorana type is a, is a burning question. Because, okay, if we, you know, know that, that would help, you know, say, the, you know, the theorists, you know, to build model. And uh, if we now uh, believe, you know, neutrino, uh, you know, points to, you know, okay, say, uh, you know, some crack in the standard model, then that means, okay, there will be physics, okay, the, that we haven't learned before. So one experiment that would be important will be, uh, you know, the proton decay, because, okay, the, you know, certainly there are, you know, the new models you know, that predict you know, that should happen. So doing that kind of experiment will guide us okay, the, you know, in the right direction. And also I agree, you know, the dark matter certainly is uh, really you know, critical. Uh, however, the personally, I have no idea what you know, dark matter is. So at this moment, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a, you know, say a, a clear picture you know, how to tackle this problem. And then uh, at an even higher scale, uh, we know, know certainly that we cannot continue to build an accelerator, you know, uh, bigger and bigger. You know, like Fermi said, okay, well, build, a, build one around the equator. And I don't think we can afford that. <laughs> um, so, you know, one way, you know, uh, we may be able to get some idea about, you know, say, the very high energy scale is, okay, the, you know, the look at the cosmo in particular, and, okay, whether you know, the inflation theory is, is correct or not. So I would okay, uh, certainly invest okay, in that area along with okay, other experiments. Uh, in addition uh, to all the uh, neutrino uh, problems people have mentioned before, I think we have uh, other issues like uh, nature news problem, the hierarchy problem, and so on. So with the completion, with the discovery of Higgs uh, particle, there seems the uh, the standard model is complete, but we believe uh, 
it is still uh, an effective theory. There should be uh, physics beyond that. So we need uh, 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 newer colliders, higher energy in, uh, machines to look for physics beyond the standard model. Um. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for addressing this question. I've um, I've been looking at the list of winners, and I've noticed one uh, interesting formula that three out of five experiments uh, are located in Japan. So, what what is so special about Japan in terms of uh, <laughs> uh, neutrino physics? Do, Takaki, you wanna? Well, okay. Oh, <laughs> difficult question. Well. I, I, well, I don't find any special reason for this fact, but, well, at least I can say that we are fortunate that super, we, we had Super Kamiokande operated already in 96, that is about 20 years ago, and, well, this had a real boost in the uh, neutrino studies. Well, first of all, we were able to do atmospheric and solar neutrino studies. And well, because the super Kamiokande was built, then the cavity for the Kamiokande was empty, essentially. And therefore, another experiment, Kamiokande was able to run. And in addition, super Kamiokande is a big detector. And there was an idea to use super Kamiokande as the far detector. So, I, in my opinion, I think the key was the um, early construction of the super Kamiokande detector. And I'd like to mention for this um, early, uh, early realization, uh, we would like to thank professor, late Professor Tosca for his great effort for, for this. But uh, experimental physics in Japan, um, it seems like there is a lot of investment going on in, 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 in Japan in that area. C can you comment on this? Yeah, yeah but well, well, I, I think we have the environment to, to really uh, invest money for this area. Well, another observation I made was that four out of five uh, experiments were made in Asia. So, <laughs> so Yifang, uh, can you can you tell us why uh, sort of why China decided to focus in this area? Um, China is a latecomer um, particle physics. We only started the experimental effort in uh, uh, 80s, I think. Uh, with this uh, E plus and minus collider uh, in Beijing, we managed to build up team the uh, the community. And, uh, and uh, then, uh, fortunately, in the uh, uh, beginning of this century, we have this opportunity to uh, build up uh, uh, a neutrino experiment uh, in China, thanks to the, uh, uh, the power plant nearby. And there is also a mountain, so you are able to build up this experiment. And uh, relatively speaking, this is a small scale experiment compared to all the other particle physics experiments. So I have to say we are very lucky and, uh, and also with this small investment, we got some results. Yes, please. One, one thing? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, in Japan, uh, we think the continuation is essential. Don't stop the research activities by budget cuts. For instance, in Kamioka, Kamioka, we started, uh, I joined Kamioka, Kamioka experiment for uh, Kamioka experiment 25, 30, 30 years ago, Kamiokande, after the Super Kamiokande, then Kamuland. Now Kamuland is now going to the next uh, second generation experiment. And also in particle physics, Japan also started the electron position collider, uh, electron position collider, Tristan, Tristan, then KKB factory. Now we will start the uh, Super KKB, KKB factory uh, near, uh, uh, soon, uh, next January. Also, we are, we, have, we are so much eager to, to host the uh, yeah, linear collider next, uh, uh, for the next, next generation. Therefore, continuation, continuation. This is essential for, for keeping the activities. Yes, please. Uh, when we started the K2K, yeah, we had a good 
excellent competitor in US also uh, planned to do the experiment from Fermi lab to the new detector. And uh, I think the, uh, of course, in addition to those uh, Kamioka, uh, Kamiokan site already exist, uh, uh, US had an excellent accelerator, and we had a relatively inferior accelerator in Japan. So we, uh, we had a good, uh, good competition uh, in uh, starting up the uh, long baseline experiment. And looks to me, I'm already retired, so I can't say anything, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks to me the big difference was the uh, uh, decision-making process of a future plan. Uh, we had the right person at the, di the Director General at KEK to decide, go ahead with the uh, K2K. And uh, that had a big effect. And I don't know the system, what's going on in US, or I only know from outside, so I can't compare directly, but uh, it was a big effect. Uh, right decision-making person at the right place. And well, I'll add one thing, and I'd like to add what Kajita says. And there was two water chain of detectors before Super Kamiokande, one in Japan, Kamiokande, and the other one is the IMB in the United States. Size is much, much bigger in the IMB. IMB 8,000 tons. Kamioka, Kamioka is 1,000 tons. But the difference is the size of the light sensor. And Kamioka uses 50 centimeter diameter, and the IMB is uh, 8 inches. So that makes the uh, energy resolution and the energy threshold different. So Kamioka are able to detect solar neutrinos, but uh, and the IMB didn't. Then the Super K, and the, I, most of the IMB people and Kamiokande people come together and build Super Kamiokande. That is a joint effort in Japan and the US. Uh, may, may I add a few words? Well, since I am the only the US uh, researcher you know, in this panel, maybe <laughs> I, can, uh, I can add a few words. Uh, when, when I you know, uh, came to the U.S. You know, the, for graduate study, at that time, the U.S. You know, mentality was, you know, okay, can do. So every time you know, when the, you know, we came up with uh, new ideas, essentially, you know, okay, we could mount the experiment in a very short time. For instance, uh, you know, when I was a graduate student, basically I could do you know, two experiments in one year. Um, so people you know, the, was very supportive, and people were willing you know, to you know, okay, say, go out their way to help. And there were very little you know, okay, bureaucratic you know, interference. However, nowadays, I feel that uh, the US system uh, has changed quite a bit. It's becoming very, very conservative. And a lot of the time, even though you know, we, we have ideas, however, you know, okay, the, before you know, we can you know, mount experiment, we have to go through a lot of hoops. And I think that this is slowing down, okay, progress, and also costing you know, the project, okay, a lot more than, okay, it should be. And I think that this is hurting, you know, the US scientific community. Now, this is, okay, my personal opinion. You know, one country that violates my Asian theory is Canada. So why, uh, why, uh, why Canada, a relatively small country, was, uh, <laughs> was, uh, was involved in, in, in this, and, uh, and what is the status of experimental uh, physics in Canada? Art, can you? My kids have a, a term for that, it's pew. <laughs> Not quite so uh, uh, small, about a tenth the size of the United States. So, but uh, before I uh, comment on a couple of natural advantages we had in, in Canada in pursuing this project, let me point out this was an international project from the very beginning. Uh, our uh, two co-spokesmen of the group of 16 that came together in 1964, 1984 were uh, uh, Herb Chen uh, from University of California at Irvine and George Ewan from Queen's University, and I'm actually very pleased that Herb's daughter, Christine, is here with us today, and uh, she's an accomplished astronomer in her own right, so uh, that's very nice. <laughs> and, and so this really was an international project from the beginning, but the two natural advantages that we had in doing it in Canada were uh, 
the availability of a very deep uh, site, uh, two kilometers underground, which we were fortunate to have uh, uh, the uh, company INCO allow us to, to use, even though they were, it's a very active nickel mine still. And uh, the availability of uh, heavy water in Canada, which we were able to borrow from uh, a Canadian uh, government agency, uh, 300 million bucks for 10 years for a dollar, that's pretty good leverage in any market, so uh, we uh, were very fortunate with that. In the 1980s when this uh, project was starting, it was, uh, it was difficult in Canada, it was large for Canada, and uh, the funding agencies that had to come together to uh, make it happen uh, were a combination of uh, agencies to deal with a project that was larger than what is normally funded and uh, we had uh, good support from the US and the UK uh, in the process of bringing it together and so it was funded in 1990 and uh, eventually the results that uh, the prize is being given for were obtained in 2001 and 2002. Um, but in 2003 uh, Canada had actually changed uh, substantially <clears throat> in its support for science. Uh, there has been uh, very good support over the last uh, uh, well, starting roughly 1997 or so, there was a program of, uh, called the Canada Foundation for Innovation in which $10 billion has been put on, on the table, essentially with a combination of federal and uh, provincial uh, support for uh, equipment, predominantly, uh, for basic research or applied research. And uh, you have to multiply that then by that factor of 10 in order to get the equivalent of the United States. And in addition to that, Canada put forward a program in which 2,000 uh, chairs in uh, various sciences were put into uh, universities across the, the country, 1,000 of them permanent uh, support from the federal government and, uh, and uh, 1,000 of them junior positions with seven-year terms renewable. So uh, Canada actually put a lot of money into research and development starting in about 1997 under the previous Liberal government and it was continued by the Conservatives. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, produced a, a substantial uh, impact uh, in uh, terms of uh, the ability to do research and development in Canada. So by the time it came to 2003 and uh, the snow results demonstrated that uh, the particular location we were in was uh, uh, a valuable one uh, in terms of uh, the ability to go on and do further neutrino physics and now uh, uh, dark matter measurements as well. Once we learned that uh, in the interim that neutrinos were in fact too light to be the dark matter particles and wanted to continue. Uh, and so Snow Lab was created and in this case we actually were able to apply to uh, a program where the intention was to bring international scientists to Canada to participate with uh, uh, with Canadians, uh, three separate national laboratories were created at the same time by a program uh, that was put in place at that time. So I would say that in fact in Canada things have changed substantially over the lifetime uh, that I've been involved in this neutrino physics activity and, uh, and it's pretty good right now in terms of our ability to uh, go and seek uh, new opportunities to do science. So uh, since you asked. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, well, the next question uh, logically would be, uh, what are the experiments you are working on right now? Let's start with Takaki. What I'm working on now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, actually, uh, I'm spending... Director's job. <laughs> <laughs> well, director's job, yes, yes. Um, well, of, of course, I'm spending much time for the director's job, but, well, for the spare time, I'm, <laughs> I'm working in a gravitational wave uh, project in Japan, which is called Kagura. That is a underground three kilometer by three kilometer interferometer located in, again in Kamioka. What is, the, uh, uh, what is the difference with the US experiment? Well, okay, US uh, LIGO is slightly bigger. They have four kilometer by four kilometer um, lengths. However, well, we have some spe special technology to be used, that is the cryogenic mirrors. Well, the, now the, these interferometers are so sensitive, therefore even the thermal noise of the mirror is a problem. So we are going to cool down the main mirrors to about 20 Kelvin. 
so that we can re reduce the effect of the thermal noise. That's the difference. Yeah, I'm still working on the uh, neutrino uh, fraction time. Then I mostly concentrate on the dark matter experiment. And uh, we built the uh, dark matter detector five years ago and called XMAS, and which is the uh, single phase rigid xenon detector. Okay. The why single phase? It's uh, different from the two phase. Two phase is practically much better at this moment, and they could identify the nuclear recoil very well with very low, low background. XMAS is slightly higher background. However, XMAS are, are sens has a sensitivity to E gamma events. So now you know the, we don't know anything about dark matter. You know, a few years ago, everybody talking about the supersymmetry and the WIMPs. But these days, people start looking for other than WIMPs. So in that situation, the sensitivity to have East, east and gamma is much, much desirable. So XMAS is probably can work and do some kind of good contribution for the dark matter search. So I'm doing dark matter search now. Art? So uh, I'm involved in uh, uh, two projects. I'm retired from teaching now, but uh, still uh, involved uh, in uh, Snow Plus, which is uh, a uh, uh, use of the, of the snow detector for um, uh, neutrino double beta decay predominantly. We replaced the, uh, uh, the heavy water with uh, liquid scintillator. Um, I'm actually very pleased to be here at Berkeley because Berkeley is a substantial uh, participant in that experiment, and they were a very substantial participant in the uh, snow experiment in the first place, and so uh, it's a pleasure to be here with colleagues. Um, that uh, attempt is to uh, load uh, tellurium into the liquid scintillator uh, in a substantial amounts and uh, to be able to address uh, questions of neutrinos double beta decay. There is also the potential to do uh, solar neutrino physics, uh, geophysics, uh, geoneutrinos, I should say. Uh, and uh, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a broad range uh, experiment which we hope to have in operation uh, uh, later this year and progressing towards a neutrino uh, double beta decay in about two years. Um, the other experiment I'm involved in is in dark matter. It's, uh, uh, a, it's a four tons of liquid um, argon, uh, an experiment called DEAP, D-E-A-P, and uh, we're actually hoping to turn that on uh, in, uh, within the next couple of months. And uh, our hope um, over a three-year counting period would be to have uh, sensitivity about uh, 10 times greater than the present level for uh, heavier mass uh, um, uh, dark matter particles, WIMPs, essentially, is what we're looking for in this case. And uh, uh, so it's fun to still be actively involved in these experiments and, and not have to be the director anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a hypothetical question. If you would uh, pick one experiment that you would do without budgetary constraints, sort of in the next 25 years, uh, what, what would that be? Well, as, as you can hear, I'm interested in those two topics. Um, I think... Uh, uh, <laughs> so how big can you go well, sort of in, in, in the time frame? I, I was going to qualify that by saying that uh, you say without budgetary constraints. I think uh, there's a, a hundred uh, million or, or maybe more, 150 million experiment that could be done that would push dark matter to the limits in which the background for atmospheric neutrinos in, in the heavy mass area would limit you. With respect to neutrinos as double beta decay, I think they, if, if I had all the money in the world, uh, the limits are uh, perhaps uh, uh, such that if you put a, a you know, $500 million into a, uh, an experiment, which would have to be an international collaboration. And I, I'm actually pleased to see the way a number of the collaborations are recognizing that this is the case, and the present generation experiments are coming together uh, to say, well, we have two different technologies, but uh, we'll pick the best one and try to go for the, uh, the largest one. I think the potential there of exploring all the way down to uh, uh, a region where you're fairly sure that you will have 
the opportunity to observe uh, neutrinos double beta decay if neutrinos are Majorana particles is there. And so I would put my 500 million or so into that one if I uh, had unlimited funding. So 500 million is for you no budgetary constraints, right? No. no let's say, say you go, let's say you go, <laughs> if you go 10 times more than 500, <laughs> what would you do? Well, for me, it's quite a price constraint. <laughs> Question, first question, what's Yes, yeah, so what is uh, the experiment you're working on right now? Uh, uh, ten years ago, I had to give up my scientific activities because of moving from Tokyo University to KEK as a director general. All, all uh, jobs are administrative jobs, no science activities. Then uh, since this April, uh, I, uh, yeah, since this April, I am now the uh, president of a local university, Iwate Prefectural, Iwate Prefectural University. So this has meaning, this, is, uh, this means a, a serious point. So Iwate, pre, pre, the Prefecture Iwate is the chanted site of linear collider, for future linear collider. So all the time I am now working in the, in the administrative jobs. Yes. Uh, I have I'm enjoying my retirement time, <laughs> so uh, let me let me mention the uh, since uh, Yuri already talked about uh, the T2K is still going on, so let me uh, explain the uh, main purpose of the T2K, and uh, T2K main objection objective is the uh, uh, studying a mu nu oxidation, and uh, this is the uh, unique advantage which. Uh, the uh, solar neutrino and atmospheric neutrino delta M square region uh, contribute at the sim simultaneously. And uh, that is a good po best position at this moment to look for CP violation, obviously, in the neutrino oscillation. And uh, people is, uh, young uh, colleague is uh, doing the uh, hard job to pursue that direction by both uh, uh, including the uh, power of uh, JPAC uh, proton accelerator and uh, proposing a new uh, detector in Kamioka site. And uh, if I were, I had 50 more years, uh, the finding out the CP violation is one thing, but I want to point out that uh, uh, the real physics is uh, exist not uh, uh, just finding out the difference of neutrino and neutrino, but uh, we have to look for what is the cause of uh, CP violation if it were found in the uh, neutrino sector. And just like a uh, uh, coke sector was proved to be dominated by uh, Kobayashi Maska mechanism, but it not necessarily uh, true uh, if the neutrino CP violation ob observed. And uh, that may be a, a medium term goal of the experiment. Okay. Uh, right now, I am still working on uh, Dye Bay because uh, we still have you know, so, you know, at least uh, two more years of uh, run time. So the idea is, okay, after we uh, Proven that you know, the you know the last mixing angle is large. Now we want to measure it as precise as we can because okay the in the foreseeable future, you know probably the Dye experiment is the only one that can really measure this uh, you know fundamental uh, parameter you know that well. And in addition, uh, you know we are also working on a new experiment called Dune, uh, which is okay a, a U.S. the, the European uh, the collaboration. So the idea is to use okay this experiment uh, to uh, study you know the ordering of you know, the masses of the neutrinos because right now we know that okay, the you know the neutrinos uh, have masses. However, we don't know how okay, they are ordered. So this is okay, something you know, the, you know uh, this uh, doing experiment can address okay very well. And in addition. 
we can also okay, the use the experiment you know, to uh, look at you know, the so-called CP violation. That is, okay, say some kind of asymmetry between neutrino and anti-neutrino. So those are the two you know, the remaining questions okay, in neutrino oscillation. So what would be your favorite one if you had unlimited budget? Uh, well, I, I, I am in favor of okay, art and uh, the other's proposal. I think the certainly the understanding of the, the nature of the neutrino is very important. And since okay, there are a lot of okay, isotopes you know, we can use to, uh, for studying neutrino less than double bit decay, so certainly there's a lot of room for new experiments. So if, uh, say, we have you know, say, the unlimited budget, I would okay, just okay, farm out okay, maybe, you know, half a dozen to a dozen experiments so that they can look at different uh, isotopes and see which one you know, will give us okay, say, the, the winning signal. Yifang? So uh, with the success of the IBA, we managed to get Chinese government to support us to build the next generation uh, React neutrino experiment. Uh, we, uh, I totally agree with what had been said before. Uh, continuation is very important. So this time, we again, uh, 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 we are going to uh, build a React-based neutrino experiment and also liquid scintillator uh, technology. Uh, this detector will be uh, a few orders of magnitude larger than Diabe, so this is a 20 kiloton uh, liquid scintillate detector uh, with a size of uh, uh, diameters roughly 35 meters of, uh, of uh, uh, acrylic uh, detector. So uh, this is what I'm, I'm trying to uh, work on right now, and hopefully the uh, experiment uh, can be built by the year of 2020. And uh, with this detector, we can measure the neutrino mass hierarchy, uh, look at the uh, supernova neutrinos if we are lucky, and also uh, uh, detect uh, solar neutrinos and geon neutrinos and so on. Now, uh, I know that you're involved in uh, big effort in, in, in China, potentially big effort in China, to, uh, to build a big uh, accelerator. Uh, is it the one that you would do if you had unlimited budget? Yeah, of course. Uh, if I have uh, unlimited budget, say uh, billions of dollars or tens of billions of dollars, uh, I hope that uh, we can build a world largest uh, collider starting from uh, electron the position phase to look for Higgs, uh, uh, to study in detail the Higgs properties and also looking for signs of new physics beyond the standard model. And, uh, and afterwards, in the same terminal, we can convert this machine to a, a proton collider with roughly an energy of 100 TeV. And by doing this, you can really probe the physics uh, beyond the standard model by, uh, say, at the energy scale, it's another uh, uh, factor of 10 uh, uh, higher than HC can uh, probe. How big uh, is the projected size of this machine? Uh, it is not, uh, I think it's roughly uh, 50 kilometers, 200 kilometers of uh, circumference, based on the money, of course. <laughs> and uh, and w with 100 kilometers, you would be able to reach those uh, levels, energy? Right, right. And uh, what is uh, the realistic time frame uh, for that project, if, uh, if there is some sort of a green light? Uh, I would imagine something like for the electron phase uh, 10 years from now to start with. And for the proton machine, it probably you need to wait for uh, uh, 25, 30 years to, uh, to, to get the data or to, to, to be probed to, to that phase. So um, it, is a long, uh, it is a long journey. And uh, to what extent do you think it should be sort of an international effort? Uh, absolutely, it has to be international. Uh, I don't think any single country can do it by its alone uh, for many reasons. So uh, uh, we hope that this is uh, going to unite the uh, world effort to build the, uh, this large collider. And uh, how that relates to the CERN uh, collider which is currently in operation? 
uh, certainly we will benefit a lot from the experience uh, and the technologies uh, learned from CERN. And, uh, and uh, in the end, there, were, there should be only one accelerator, so we have to work with CERN together to see what is the best way to build this, uh, this world-only collider and find the best place to do it. And uh, what kind of physics do you think this collider can, uh, uh, can study? You mentioned Higgs, but can you elaborate on this a little more? Well, first of all, Higgs is the only particles with a spin zero, so uh, we haven't seen any ad elementary particles like this. We need to study very much in detail its properties to understand whether Higgs is the uh, uh, composite or uh, uh, elementary, to understand whether there's any uh, uh, companion uh, partners of uh, this existing Higgs, and, uh, and also all these couplings to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the known fermions. And by doing this, we try to understand the, um, the property of, uh, of Higgs itself, and also we like to know the self-couplings of Higgs. So this will tell you that electro uh, a weak phase transition uh, uh, and types, what kind of uh, this, this phase transition and the potential shape. Uh, with all these studies, we hope that we can uh, uh, find uh, indications of new physics beyond the standard model and then give us a way to or at least uh, tell us how we should build a proton collider there. So there is um, another uh, incredible experimental physicist in the room, uh, sitting there in the corner, Sol Permuder, who is also the uh, Nobel Prize winner and Breakthrough Prize winner. Um, I just use my power of a moderator to ask you a question. What, <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what experiment would you build if you did not have budgetary constraints? I, I do think that right, right now there, there are some real opportunities in the, the astrophysics areas that we've, that we've been working in um, where if we were able to build a, you know, the, the, the full system we would like, we would be able to see uh, you know, space-based uh, uh, sp telescope missions. Um, and there's also some ground-based uh, missions that, that could be combined with it where we think we would be able to get a much more detailed accounting of the history of the expansion of the universe and the growth of, of, uh, of structure in the universe. Um, that would tell us a little about this part of the story that has to do with the dark energy and perhaps even the bringing together of the uh, questions of gravity and the other three forces. So you're talking about the optical? So, the, well, actually, it would probably be at this point you'd want to do a full range from, uh, if you really had a budget for this, from the, uh, the ultraviolet through the infrared. Because um, I think that a lot of the story um, you can capture in, the, in these different parts of the, of the wavelength bands that you otherwise can't, can't reach. And this is one of the reasons why the space-based um, efforts are, I think, so important at this point. We actually think that it's a possibility that one of these desires may come about in the, uh, in the near future, but we're... Uh, we're, we're Looking forward to seeing what happens. And in terms of the main parameters, what would be the size of this, the, the scale? Well, so far, um, the considerations that we've had have all been budget limited. Um, so we've uh, often you know, held ourselves to something we thought was practical. But if you are really opening us up in this range, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we should remember that we're now designing um, telescopes uh, in optical and infrared on the ground that are in the you know, 30 meter um, scale. And uh, it would be a real challenge and it'd be fun to see if we could try to do something like that in the uh, space uh, in, as well. Okay, thank you. I just, I'll probably at this point open the room for questions from, from, from the audience. Yes, Edward. I guess I have a question. Uh, I guess I have a question for Art. So um, <clears throat> you're wor building the neutrinoless double beta decay detector now, but you said that for half a billion, you could imagine one that would reach farther and go down to the lowest scale, at which it's plausible if nature doesn't conspire against us, that 
the myron mass ought to be. So I just wondered if the bigger, if it would simply be a bigger version based on the same idea, or what would you have to do to get down to that level? Well, I think there's a question both of scale and also of technology, and there are a number of uh, technologies that are being explored that uh, are uh, potentially uh, uh, capable of uh, of dealing with this, ranging from solid-state uh, uh, detectors, the Majorana and Gerda experiments, for example, um, where uh, uh, it would be a scale-up question in terms of uh, the amount of material, uh, as well as uh, having to, to in, in all of these cases, deal with the low radioactivity uh, requirements in order to get the background down in, in terms of trying to uh, to do this. Uh, quarry experiment is also using bolometry to try to do this. Uh, uh, there, I think you want to improve the uh, technology for reducing the background. Uh, the uh, question of, uh, of uh, liquid, uh, uh, liquid, liquid uh, well, scintillating material, cryogens that uh, have the possibility of, uh, of uh, pushing down as well, such as the XO experiment. And all of these technologies have different pluses and minuses, but all of them would need an, an amount of material which is uh, at least 10 times, maybe uh, 50 times greater than what we're dealing with today in order to get the type of sensitivity in a finite period of time, because you're looking for enormous, uh, greater than 10 to the 25th year half-lives in this case, which means you have to have uh, a heck of a lot more than 10 to the 25th atoms in order to get your measurements uh, made uh, if you really want to, uh, to get there. So uh, uh, I think it's a combination of technology and scale uh, that needs to occur. And uh, I think all of these experiments can collaborate on the basis of uh, how do we reduce the radioactivity. I think the question of choice among the technology, uh, including uh, liquid scintillator-based experiments like SNOW Plus, um, is something that uh, really needs to be an open and fair uh, comparison between them and then an international uh, participation uh, to try to, to do this as you get in the accelerator field. I think these are important questions and, and things that uh, the type of philosophy that has gone forward in terms of building international uh, facilities like CERN is important to bring into this uh, sort of area as well. Question over, perhaps for laypersons. Um, can you give us an understanding of how we would measure dark matter uh, on Earth? I mean, the interaction between dark matter and conventional matter is somewhat uncertain and uh, and therefore can you give us a appreciation as to what's would you, would we be able to directly measure it or would it be by by inference dark matter experiments why don't you go ahead no 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 you do <laughs> you're, you're measuring dark matter too well the i don't know if i get your question correctly but then i i would say that and that it is necessary to make and the observe the interaction directly to find it out the what kind of you know the particles and dark matter is. Otherwise, you are not able to identify those things. So direct measurement is very much essential and important. Art, you want to add to that? Art, no, you don't want to. Basically, what you end up uh, doing is looking for. Uh, processes that could only occur as a result of a dark matter particle uh, striking your detector. Um, uh, you would agree. <laughs> um, so you, you, you put your detector in a location that is as low in other radioactivity processes as you can possibly manage, one of them being deep underground and uh, therefore shielding out the cosmic rays that might cause interference and then very careful choice of materials in creating your detector, uh, very careful understanding of what other radioactivity looks like in terms of the typically bursts of light you're dealing with in this case, uh, 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 or electrical pulses that uh, uh, represent what a dark matter particle would do compared to what anything else could do. And uh, that's the process. You, you, it's a process of elimination of everything else. Uh, but you put it in a location where only dark matter particles and local radioactivity can possibly make events in your detector. And then you uh, eventually end up trying to convince people that what you've seen 
legitimately is dark matter. And then you have seasonal effects uh, uh, that can uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, dark matter uh, behaves in a certain way. Uh, that's not exclusive. You can get seasonal effects in radioactivity as well, but that's the process. Okay. Um, the question uh, Yuri asked was, if there is unlimited fund, what experiment you would pursue? But I want to ask if there is no budgetary constraint, what the world should pursue? Of course, with unlimited fund, they should do everything, okay? But uh, colliders or cosmic measurements, a lot of things, right? What would be your priority if you are the d director of the world scientific community? <laughs> That's the question, not what you would do, yeah. Anybody, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, my first priority is to do the proton decay experiment on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> no, no atmospheric neutrino background. <laughs> yes, please. I have a small question, which perhaps is a kind of follow-up to that last answer, which is how much beyond the super-K limit on the proton lifetime can we hope for in an ideal experiment or in some imaginable future? How much better can we hope to do with proton decay? Anyone who wants to answer that? Um, 15 years ago, I, 15 years ago, I proposed that the one big detector and the total mass is 10 megaton under C. Then that reaches to you brings you to 10 to 36 years for E plus, E pi naught mode. So that, that is the, the place in the under C, because in the 10 megaton, you cannot, uh, you are not able, uh, you know, the e, not easy to make a big cavity underground. So you have to bring that detector under C. What's the role for experiments like IceCube going forward? As far as I can see, and uh, they have to fight with the uh, resolution and the threshold to do the proton decay. Of course, and they, uh, they are making effort to reduce those things. And uh, I hope and they can get some, in, uh, some measurement on proton decay, but they have to first demonstrate and uh, their detector can work for proton decay. We, we heard earlier about looking for dark matter, but what about dark energy? How, how can that be found? Saul should answer that. <laughs> <laughs> So far, all the ways that we have to get at dark energy have been uh, essentially looking at its effects on the expansion history of the universe and on the clumping of, 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 of material in the universe. But there have been a f just a few thoughts about possible, uh, you know, sort of uh, AMO style um, detector experiments where you can actually look for something like a Casimir effect that you might e expect from a certain versions of a, of a dark, en dark energy theories. Um, so there's one uh, this, that was published this year, in fact. Um, and I think that obviously that would be really exciting if you got to the point that you were able to do something where you could s actually measure something directly. So this is a pretty open-ended question, but um, so in physics, we've gone from like atoms to protons and neutrons, and now we're at quarks. Do you think we're gonna keep going? Like it seems like our definition of fundamental particles keep changing, like uh, every few centuries or something. So this is, this is probably a question for Edward. <laughs> You want to take that? <laughs> I mean, it's unlikely that our current concept is the ultimate answer, but it's also anybody's guess how successful we can be at going definitively beyond it. I think for now I'll stick to that answer. <laughs> Would 
any of you like to comment on uh, the interplay of cosmological limits on neutrino mass relative to uh, direct uh, detection? Uh, I think uh, that it's fascinating that, in fact, uh, cosmological limits are in the same range as uh, uh, terrestrial measurements uh, these days, at least within factors of three or four. Um, and uh, uh, my discussions with people who are doing such uh, uh, measurements uh, are, first of all, uh, they're very optimistic that they'll be able to improve their accuracy significantly as they go forward. Secondly, they would consider a terrestrial measurement uh, something of value to them in terms of reducing the number of priors that they have in their analysis and perhaps obtaining more accurate information on other parameters that are in this absolutely remarkable, I think it's six parameter Lambda CDM uh, model for our, uh, our universe. So uh, I think it's very complementary, the uh, work that's being done in these two areas and, uh, and quite remarkable that you're in the same uh, sort of energy regime uh, right, or mass regime right now in the two cases. So I guess I will use my powers one last time to uh, terminate the discussion. And I want to thank uh, Berkeley for providing us this platform, our panelists for uh, participation. And uh, of course, it, it was great to have uh, Edward and Saul also in the room. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming.